Greetings to all uh, from Washington, DC. My name is Irfan Nuruddin. I am the Senior Director of the Atlantic Council South Asia Center and Professor in the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. It is a tremendous honor to bring to you this conversation with Dr. Lote Sering, the Honorable Prime Minister of the Kingdom of Bhutan. Uh, the Prime Minister is joining us today live uh, from uh, Bhutan. He is not in the capital because he has been doing an extensive tour of the Eastern districts of his country. Uh, we are very grateful that he has made the time in spite of his incredibly busy schedule and with some tremendous logistical issues that needed to be overcome. This is a unique conversation for us because in Washington, it is too often that the attention on South Asia focuses primarily on the larger countries of India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and sometimes Bangladesh. But South Asia is much more than just those large countries and Bhutan represents for us an example of a country making its way in this global world with tremendous lessons for how other countries can develop their economic energy and foreign policies. And to explore all of these issues, it is a tremendous honor today to welcome the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, welcome. Thank you. I'd like to start, uh, Prime Minister, by just giving you the opportunity to set the flow for this conversation. Uh, you are traveling through your country. You are now well into your term as the third democratically elected PM of your country. As you travel at the end of what, well, at whatever the stage we are of this pandemic, as you explore your country once again, what are you seeing? What makes you excited? And what do you see as the most immediate challenges facing your government and your country? I mean, <clears throat> good, good, uh, Dr. Ifan and your team for giving me this opportunity, actually. I really don't know how the conversation will go, but uh, I'll be happy to get any questions that you feel like asking me, and then I'll leave the rest of the job to your team. In fact, uh, uh, I also felt that, that, that the timing of our conversation is very good because, uh, as you rightly said, I'm not in the capital. I'm far east in part of the country, and then, um, as I was saying, uh, Last uh, almost 10, 20 days, 20, almost 20 days, I was really in the woods. And last three days was quite bad. Uh, the places that I visited last three days are um, not heard of by every Bhutanese, but except for, for Bhutanese in this part of the country. And then those part of the country were considered very remote. And then uh, uh, we also, of course, uh, I traveled a couple of times before during my um, election uh, movements. But this time, I was very happy to see that uh, it wasn't so remote as, uh, as I thought. I mean, to, to uh, start a conversation, many would say that a place like Gomdar, a place like Wangfu, um, if people in the capital uh, hear these words, uh, they will consider these places very remote. But now, at least, uh, I'm happy uh, that I could drive through these villages, how, how much ever rough it may be. And uh, um, a little while ago, I complained that uh, um, the connectivity was quite erratic, but uh, let me let me rephrase myself. At least there is some internet connection. I could uh, see some 3Gs flashing up and some spots of 4Gs coming up. And we are looking forward to uh, connecting Bhutan to 5G too. So uh, in a short while, well, we have come a long way, Dr. Ivan, to put it straight. Uh, it's a remarkable achievement. And I'll, I'll come back to those points about 3G bars and 4G bars in a second. <laughs> and let me start though with a very general question. For many Westerners, uh, when they hear the name uh, of your country, Bhutan, what comes immediately to mind is this innovative notion of gross national happiness as a metric by which we should really be evaluating a country's progress. I imagine that the concept is both a matter of pride, but also maybe uh, you know the frustration <laughs> on your part and the part of your fellow policymakers at the oversimplification of this concept in Western circles. How should we understand your government's orientation towards economic development and progress? And what is the relationship of that to this, you know, much more esoteric concept of happiness, as it were? Well, I, I almost could guess that that would be your first question. And because that is what I was asked by many non bhutanese because uh, the first thing that I that that uh, probably goes or comes across their mind is uh, uh, gross national gross national happiness. 
or Bhutan, oh, land of happiness, you know, oh, a land filled with uh, people who are very happy. I mean, those, those are the conversations that have been going around. I would say, I wouldn't say anything wrong with that, but on a very um, open note, uh, we, we tend to follow a little different course. When we talk about GNH, gross national happiness, we actually don't mean, um, don't relate that to uh, somebody's uh, mood uh, on that particular time. We don't relate gross national happiness or principles or philosophies of gross national happiness to somebody who is being very happy on, on that occasion or at that particular point in time. It is definitely not the ha-ha, he he kind of happiness we are talking about. I think on that happiness part, little elated mood, little depressed mood, I think will happen to every individual in the world in a similar manner. For us, we are talking about happiness of the nation. Yeah, and then uh, to, to qualify that, it would include happiness of the animals around, happiness of the trees around, uh, serenity of this environment around, cleanliness of the river that is flowing down the mountain around, the crisp feel that we must get uh, enjoy of the wind that is blowing across us. I mean, those are those are holistic uh, principles that we are talking about. Uh, as far as I can understand, we actually don't uh, don't go by, as I said, uh, short term happiness or related to one's mood, but uh, a principle, a philosophy that we should not forget uh, whenever we tend to, uh, whenever we uh, um, uh, frame any policies or approve any projects in the country, we must keep a holistic view of all those in picture. That in a nutshell, I would, uh, I would in my own words, uh, uh, say the cross national happiness is about, but as we go along, if you have more questions, we can always, uh, Come, come back to this because as we talk, as we talk, uh, will will I think I'll I'll be able to relate more um, points well, to gross national happiness in Bhutan. Uh, say, I for appreciate example, the uh, honest answer on that because I, I, you know, as someone who teaches and studies economic development, I have always found the concept of the holistic development really encouraging. It's innovative and it's brave at a time when so many leaders are under pressure to just demonstrate GDP per capita growth. And so I appreciate your willingness to clarify uh, for our audience how you understand it, which is, I think, very brave. In the in a democratic setting, uh, and you are, at the end of the day, you know, uh, subject to the accountability of your electorate and to the what your people want, uh, do you feel a tension in that holistic approach to also delivering short-term economic development and growth for your citizens? And then, you know, one way or the other, in a year or so, you will be up for re-election. And there will be inevitably the question of what have you been able to accomplish in this period? For many observers of economic development, this is the fundamental tension with democratic politics. Long-term holistic development takes time but elections happen every few years. Uh, how do you balance that tension between needing to be able to win a re-election while keeping your eyes on that long-term holistic development agenda? Yeah, I mean, that is that is fundamentally a very, very good question. I think uh, I didn't expect this question, but I, I'm really happy to hear that. Uh, yes, you're absolutely correct. Uh, uh, you, you want to know the tension that is happening in me or with my government uh, to draw the line between short-term short -term pledges or anything that we need to please the voters versus long-term interests of the country. Yeah? Um, I, think, uh, I think every politically elected uh, individual will have the same feeling. Every set of voters, every individual in the world will have a very common set of mindset that is to be pleased. And then uh, I don't think so, how much ever educated he or she may be, uh, they will not be able to think uh, a very, very long term in the interest of the country rather. Uh, many, many, many will be able to give lectures on that. But when it actually comes down to practicing it, he or she still would like to have something to take home, something to be benefited from. So, I mean, uh, everyone at the, at the, at the at the end of the day, we'll have some selfish motive on that. So uh, that being on the general set, uh, we also have similar, similar understanding and notion. 
that is what I was referring to when, when, when you asked me the question on GNH, uh, gross national happiness. People in Bhutan are also similarly structured. People in Bhutan also have similar expectations. So they also come, come forward to us, come to us with short-term demands that will please a set of villagers or individuals or some family members. But uh, your question is, how or where do we draw the line? How do I fight or how do I sort this tension out? Fundamentally, it all depends on, uh, to me rather, I, I, have no, I have no authority to talk about other politicians, but for myself, as I said, uh, I'm a surgeon. I am still a practicing surgeon, actually. I operate on all my holidays and weekends, and it all depends on what took me to politics. Actually, in a, in a very short, uh, straight cut note, I did not have any political in, uh, intentions. The position that I'm holding now probably came to me or my path by default. I actually was very, very interested, which I still am, in transforming health system in the country. I, I even said during my campaign, uh, campaign pledges that uh, I have been operating with a, with a surgical scalpel. If I could take a short break from that and change that into uh, operating with a pen instead of a patient, I thought I can operate few policies sign few documents uh, that could uh, uh, help uh, Bhutanese as a whole. So it seemed that was my motive. Since I still hold that uh, um, passion in me that I actually don't uh, worry too much about my long-term political career, but I really want to do something for health. Now, that was the intention with which I joined politics. Now that my friends and uh, um, uh, well wishes wanted me to take this position, uh, good enough honored to be here. So to answer your question straight, it all depends on where you draw the line and what kind of, uh, what kind of intentions you have. For me, in fact, in fact, uh, last 20 days, I've been talking on the same points. Whenever I uh, meet a group of people, they have their own set of demands, which actually do not go in line with the government policies, which we are not able to give, but politically it will be very popular, I can understand. But I have been explaining to them that my job is to explain to you. Your job is to understand. If you want to bring politics in between what we are talking today, I said this is a totally different ball game, and I will not be part of this. Some some uh, villagers wanted an improved road, which they they are not entitled to. I said I'm sorry, I cannot give this now because I have to be worried about 1,200 other villages. Some localities wanted some improved school system. Uh, free internet system in their schools. I said, well, the demand sounds reasonable, but I'm not able to give because I have to be worried about nearly 700 schools in the country. Now, if you're happy to hear this, if you understand the government's policies, thank you very much, I said. If you do not understand, if you want to be supported only in your uh, area, then I said, I cannot do it. On that note, if you're not happy with us, I said, general elections will come and show your anger on me during the election, not now, I said. So uh, I, I just go around cutting it straight. Uh, it all depends on how they take it. I really don't have to be on this seat uh, uh, forever. Uh, I don't look forward to that also at the same time. As long as I can do what I wanted to do, I'll be happy. Uh, that is a really inspirational approach to governance. And I have to say on behalf of my colleagues, I wish more uh, South Asian leaders had the same approach. I can't think of a better time to have a trained medical doctor, a surgeon, um, as prime minister and as leader than during the last two years of this terrible coronavirus pandemic that has afflicted the globe. Bhutan's uh, face the same challenges as everywhere else, but arguably with better outcomes in terms of uh, absolute mortality uh, due to the pandemic. How would you assess uh, your government's performance in dealing with the pandemic and maybe also given what you just said uh, for a lot of countries I think what the pandemic has done is expose the problematic public health infrastructure in their countries the inequities between rural and urban between rich and poor uh, between different races religions ethnicities so very honestly what would you say this pandemic has taught you about what needs to be done to prepare Bhutan for the next health emergency? Yeah, I mean, uh, I really don't know where to start from, but uh, what did the pandemic teach me? 
those few conditions that you were reading out, uh, uh, inequities between rich and poor, between urban, rural, between different ethnicities, I am I'm very sure none of those conditions apply to our system because uh, we have an absolutely free healthcare system in a country. Anybody can walk into any hospitals in the country and he or she will get the same treatment. His Majesty the King walks into the same hospital and gets the same treatment where uh, a cab driver or a farmer goes and um, uh, be attended by the same physician. So on that note, we actually, actually have no issues about rich and poor or urban rural. And uh, on, uh, on uh, uh, quality, yes, being totally free, and Bhutan being little uh, resource constraint, as you know, uh, we actually have uh, problems with uh, providing quality healthcare, especially in tertiary healthcare. But, uh, but we actually have a very, very strong, uh, well-connected uh, set of primary healthcare system in the country. It goes down right into the village level, if not at the household level. Our primary health, uh, healthcare workers are stationed in every village a village will be of 10, 15 households with some 50, 60 uh, individuals. So uh, at least about 50, 60 to 100 individuals will be taken care of by a basic health facility with a couple of them, three or four primary health care providers. And that system was well set for last four or five decades. And then as you move towards uh, uh, the urban places, as the population density increases, we have higher level of hospital system and we have more qualified and more experienced uh, uh, group of uh, healthcare professionals. So that being our health setup for Bhutan, I thought that was one of the biggest advantage that we had. Totally free and absolutely, uh, uh, um, I would say, uh, well, net, uh, uh, well connected primary healthcare. I'm not talking about uh, tertiary healthcare. And then uh, to actually take the, take the major load of the pandemic, it was the primary healthcare that was required, not really on the tertiary healthcare. That is one. And it was always uh, the command and demand of His Majesty the King. All the majesties always insisted on keeping health and education uh, absolutely free for every Bhutanese. So uh, uh, starting from there, that was, that was one, I would say, uh, a very good factor that, that supported us very well. And then all those primary healthcare centers actually were well versed with uh, screening infectious diseases, especially SARIs, uh, uh, severe respiratory um, ARIs. So since they were actually well uh, trained, we just had to put the word pandemic and put the word uh, SARS-CoV-2. They actually knew what to do about it. So the reporting system was also good. So actually that, that helped us a lot. And then uh, uh, coming in early during the pandemic, I think that being prepared, preparing ourselves for the worst uh, gave us the best preparation. Because uh, as you know, we, this, this pandemic started uh, in China sometime towards the end of uh, December 2019. And we started our preparation by mid-January. Uh, in three, four weeks, we started. We started screening the foreigners and Bhutanese coming back to the country. We started forming our teams and task force members, technical advisory groups we started forming. We started uh, uh, um, noting down and drafting the SOPs of uh, in the event of needing a lockdown, in the event of needing to do a primary contact tracing. I mean, all those uh, uh, workups we started doing by mid-January to end of January. And then we got the first case uh, by 5th of March, 2020, actually. It was an uh, American tourist, blessing in disguise. As we were preparing, we actually got to do it in real time. And then from that first night onwards, it was totally the dynamic changed because uh, we did not have to practice it conventionally the way we planned because His Majesty the King stepped in on that evening, 5th, uh, the Mar uh, March 5th, 2020. And then um, uh, we walked throughout the night to set out whatever we have planned into action and uh, under direct command of His Majesty the King. Then, uh, from that time onwards till now, more than over two years, His Majesty the King has not rested. He's still, he's still working out. So the other factor, uh, other than the well-connected primary healthcare system that we had, free and easily accessible, 
the second and the most important factor is leadership. Not just leadership, but an astute and unconditional leadership. A leader who is unconditionally respected and a leader who means for us. Now, when I say leader, to me, I'm elected by people. There are many people who voted for me, many who didn't vote for me. As a politically elected person, we have the same mood like a political system in any country in the world. So uh, uh, if there are three people who listen to me, there'll be two people who will not listen to me. But to our king, 100% of, uh, percent of the Bhutanese will unconditionally listen. And then this time His Majesty came out and then His Majesty set it all out for us at the beginning of the outbreak that if we do not function as one team, a small country will be wiped out by the pandemic. That was a very clear message from the beginning of the pandemic. So then we, uh, we went out on a daily basis with that message. Second, His Majesty said, we must be very, very firm with our policies. Initially, until about two, three months back, it was zero COVID policy. It was elimination policy. So we did not, uh, we were not worried about anything but eliminating the disease from the community. Until we had good, uh, uh, strong immune system, and until we knew that the viral variants are actually not too bad for us, like Omicron now. As we started off uh, by early 2020, His Majesty again was very, very clear. He said, we must go with zero death policy. His Majesty said, I will not accept any death. But deep down, I personally, as a medical person, knew what His Majesty meant. It's not a singular zero, zero, but minimum. Now we can qualify in saying all preventable death must be prevented. I mean, uh, there'll be no end to that, uh, Dr. Ifran. Uh, those are the reasons why, why we could come out, I would say, almost clean. We, of course, have a uh, have couple of deaths. And almost 100% of the deaths are actually uh, uh, people with uh, chronic uh, incurable diseases. So I, I don't mean to justify deaths, but uh, uh, I think uh, we couldn't have selected uh, um, such deaths. Uh, thank you for that comprehensive answer and for highlighting the role of you know, astute leadership, but also, as you point out, legitimate leadership that is seen by the country as unifying as opposed to divisive. I have one more question before I ask my colleague, uh, Dr. Ridhabe Shahid, to join us. And this is a question that gets really at the heart of that long-term, short-term tension we were talking about a few minutes ago uh, regarding energy policy. Bhutan has recently achieved the status of being a carbon negative uh, economy. And at a time when the climate crisis globally has seemed so urgent and when hope of, I have to confess, feels uh, quite distant, right? As countries continue to just make self-interested short-term decisions about their climate, um, about their energy policy, as opposed to thinking about the broader climate. How would you assess, again, this achievement of carbon negative? What does it mean for the economy? And what lessons maybe for other countries would you suggest Bhutan represents? Again, this is uh, Bhutan specific. I actually cannot advise uh... Uh, what other, other countries or what other leaders should be doing. But for us, we are actually very, very happy. We are uh, in a very unique situation where you rightly say it, uh, we are carbon negative. By any standard, uh, um, we are able to sink almost three times uh, the amount of greenhouse gases that we actually produce. So we are comfortably, uh, I think, one of very few or, one, or, or, or only the uh, carbon negative country in the world as of today. When the whole world is trying their best to be carbon neutral by 2050, we are already carbon negative. And that is all due to our uh, constitutional requirement of uh, forest coverage. As you may not know that uh, uh, His Majesty the Kings had always emphasized on living with the nature, a, a fundamental principles of gross national happiness that uh, our constitutional provision clearly says that we must maintain at least 60% of the country under forest cover, coverage, at least. And currently we have over 72. So 72% of Bhutan is actually forest. Now some, some people might call it jungle, 
but we call it forests. Yeah, and then uh, little beyond that, though the constitutional ma mandate is 62, we have 71%. But more than that is almost about 50% of the 72% uh, of the country being under forest is further protected as uh, national parks, biological corridors, some specific uh, areas for some uh, rare endangered species. Uh, some areas we even give uh, more importance to those uh, endangered species uh, to uh, human uh, human uh, settlement. So, I mean, uh, we have gone that far very, very strictly. Some decades ago, by the way, uh, this thing started uh, 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 way back in 1970s, when uh, there was any uh, hardly any talk about climate change, carbon neutrality. No, those, those, those languages are just coming up in the last few decades, but uh, uh, for us, the requirement of 60% of the country being under forest coverage, uh, many parts of the country being declared as uh, national parks and biological corridors had been happening way before uh, all this uh, hustle bustle about climate changes. So, I mean, uh, again, uh, so uh, grateful to our monarchs who are visionary, who all means for the country. Uh, and we are so happy that uh, uh, this is being heard, this is being appreciated and now, as I said, uh, gross national happiness. We have been, we have been designing our lives. We have been designing the governance of this country based on the principles of gross national happiness, starting way back in 1970s and 1980s. All our five-year plan, we are going through the 12th five-year plan now. The principles of our plan uh, uh, periods or activities are based on gross national happiness for last three, four, five decades, actually. So that's why, uh, since we have been very firmly practicing the principles of gross national happiness, we are able to come out as uh, being carbon neutral or carbon negative today. Uh, thank you. I think while you have very humbly said this was Bhutan specific, I think the lessons for other countries are quite ample. To maybe explicate some of those I've invited, my colleague and friend, uh, Dr. Rudabe Shahid, a non-resident senior fellow with the South Asia Center to join us in this conversation. Uh, Dr. Shahid will ask you uh, two questions, uh, Prime Minister, and then I will return uh, to ask even more. <laughs> so Rudabe, thank you for being with us and over to you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Nuruddin, for um, including me in this conversation with uh, Dr. Lute Sering, the Honorable uh, Prime Minister of uh, Bhutan. Um, Mr. Prime Minister, uh, we know that uh, you lived in uh, Bangladesh for many years where you trained as a medical doctor. So uh, my question to you is about the talks of um, Bhutan engaging in uh, cross-border electricity um, export. Uh, to uh, Bangladesh, which is now um, a rapidly growing economy uh, in the region. So um, we were wondering, when is it likely to be functional? And what are the, some of the mutual benefits uh, from such a deal? Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shahid. Uh, yes, as you, whenever I hear the word Bangladesh, it actually excites me because that's my second home. I spent almost 10 years there during my uh, undergrad as well as post-graduation, uh, uh, post-grad studies there. So uh, it, it warmly reminds me of my hot human days in Dhaka, by the way. <laughs> anyway, to get straight to your question, uh, um, yes, we have been talking about uh, um, sharing our experiences in hydropower generation with uh, Bangladesh. Bangladesh, as you rightly said, is a rapidly growing economies. And congratulations to uh, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina and her government for uh, able to for being able to manage the country country's economy during this um, uh, uh, pandemic, uh, we are highly appreciative of that. And during my visit and uh, my con conversation with Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, we actually had discussed on a bilateral hydropower uh, uh, project, and which both the countries as well as uh, uh, India we are discussing uh, on it. Uh, we have been uh, following up on this. Uh, we really want to take it further and see it happening as soon as possible. We are not very sure when it will happen because I don't have the documents on me now, right now, but uh, we would like to um, like it to happen as soon as possible. And on energy needs, uh, as you rightly said, uh, Bangladesh is growing uh, very, very fast. Bangladesh's need for energy is huge. 
I don't mean to say we have a huge potential, but little potential that we have, uh, we would like to uh, share and then be also benefited from this. So uh, if you have any more questions, questions on this, I'll be happy to take. But for now, uh, I don't have any specific dates. My only wish is to get it done as soon as possible. Thank you, uh, um, Honorable Prime Minister, for answering that question. Uh, my uh, second question to you is about um, education. So Bhutan has uh, one major institute of higher learning, the Royal University of Bhutan. Uh, many semi-autonomous institutions are under it, um, including uh, Bhutan's first private liberal arts college, the Royal uh, Thimpu College, um, which I visited a few years back. Uh, we wonder what scopes for future educational exchanges uh, that uh, Bhutanese education um, structure mm -hmm. can provide with the wider uh, South Asian region and possibly with uh, Western countries such as the US. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. I mean, uh, on education, uh, I don't know whether I'll be able to uh, do justice by answering uh, only particularly on your question about the college that you mentioned, we in short call it RTC, uh, Royal Temple College. But uh, major things are happening in the country as we talk. We are not just transforming, but we are overhauling our education system. We all, and especially His Majesty has realized, our King has realized that uh, the way we educate our children, the way we teach and learn in our schools, is not relevant anymore. That is why every year on year, we have thousands of youths graduating from colleges and schools, but we have thousands or more jobs not being taken up. There's a huge mismatch between skills that we, our educational system gives to our youth as well as, uh, I mean, up against uh, the skills that is demanded by the job market. So that is being discussed for decades, but now His Majesty has uh, commanded we, uh, we, we have received a royal degree on that. And then uh, uh, His Majesty is also now following it up very closely, meaning we are not just transforming, but overhauling our educational system. It may ultimately result or give birth to a dedicated Bhutan baccalaureate system against like an IB system. So uh, we are towards that. That starts right from uh, primary, I would say. We are designing it, designing it and marrying uh, the two health and education, B building it fundamentally, uh, 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 the fundamental co uh, uh, components of uh, human capital. <clears throat> On that, uh, health has a program uh, to look after our pregnant mothers. And a couple of months, even before conceiving, we will, we will identify the mothers who will potentially conceive, those who are planning their family, will make sure that they don't have any micronutrient deficiencies, including folate, as you know. A mother being deficient in folate, if he, she conceived, then they, they get into uh, neuronal deficiencies. So uh, after having that, after conceiving, Minister of Health will take care of uh, all the required eight ANCs. We are no, no more with four ANCs. We are with all eight ANCs, antenatal visits. And then we would like to have 100% uh, hospital delivery. Now, when I say 100% hospital delivery, uh, first of all, uh, Experts may not uh, understand what I'm talking about. In this part of the world, many deliveries happen at home, and then we get a lot of uh, birth-related complications. Ours is almost about 95%. We would like to stretch it to 100%. And then we have framed a policy to take care of the first 100 golden days. We call it 1,000 oh, sorry, the thousand golden days. That will take the babe, child up to two and a half years. And we would like then to have a uh, uh, Minister of Health to hand over the child from Minister of Health to Minister of Education and then get uh, that child enrolled in Early Childhood Care and Development System, ECCD, what we call it. So that would be a, a continuum that we are trying to design. And then from there, formal schooling will be starting. In formal schooling, major overhaul that we are doing now is isotization, isotization of the schools. We would like to have our children as young as four or five year old as they start formal education to be exposed to coding. Today, this morning, as I told you, we were in a remote part of the country 
but we are so happy that uh, some hundred, one school they had 120 children, uh, children starting from pre-primary up to the sixth grade. And that will be between uh, a five year old to somewhere between 10 to 11 year old. Uh, we, one school had 120, one school had 90 children, really, really remote, but they had a weak internet connection. They, uh, they had uh, say 15 brand new computer sets, internet connected. And now all these five year old will also get uh, three to four hours of ICT education uh, um, uh, for in a week's time, at least three to four hours a week. And uh, children are now given His Majesty has uh, gifted them with uh, a coding program called Code Monkey. They will be doing that. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm just giving you the uh, major transformation that we are coming up with. And then all education systems, we would like to go from submittive to formative. We want the teachers to run after the students. We want the students to, to, to try and see, ask themselves more questions rather than being taught. We want teaching to go out of the class and out of the test books. So uh, these are the major overhauls that we are doing. So, uh, I mean, that is uh, in a nutshell, uh, uh, the, the, the transformation that we are bringing in is just started about a year back uh, during the pandemic. And we are going uh, strong with that. But on the college that you're talking about, we are very happy that uh, at least that is a totally private college, but is doing more than what our government colleges are doing. Because as you know, when, we, when it comes to the government, the masses, the number, uh, do not, uh, it's not very favorable for us to do whatever is required to be done. So all these international accreditations, in international exchange programs, uh, research in initiatives are being taken up by this college that you just mentioned. But that attitude or, or happenings are not very good on uh, government college campuses. But yet, uh, we also would like to be fully connected. We also would like to be comparable, if not better than the uh, better colleges in the world. Now, on that, uh, since you seem to have uh, uh, visited and known the college uh, better, if you have any suggestions, please let, let me know. I'll call up the manager or the proprietor and uh, congratulate him on that. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Honorable Prime Minister. And uh, I'll have to think about it and I'll let you know. And over to you now, Dr. Nuruk. Yes, uh, Prime Minister, as a, someone like Dr. Shahid who's involved in education as a professor myself, what you've just described sounds so exciting. And if we can ever be of help and service uh, as partners, uh, please count on us. I have two questions to close this wonderful conversation we've been having. I want to zoom out uh, to the broader region in the way that Dr. Shahid already had begun to do. Uh, your first official visit as Prime Minister was to my uh, native country, India, uh, and Prime Minister Modi's first official visit uh, following his el first election in 2014 was to your uh, country, Bhutan. These two events indicate the deep, uh, intimate, and you know, multi-dimensional relationship of India and Bhutan that stretches back now over five decades. Uh, There's also a pretty unique relationship uh, given the close military and security ties between the two countries, the long border. Um, but we are also in a, at a moment where there's a lot of tensions vis-a-vis -vis your other big neighbor, uh, China. And Bhutan has been showing a willingness, uh, appropriately so, to engage in uh, different conversations with China as well. I guess it's a very open-ended question to think about, uh, to, for you to tell us about how you think about your government's foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis the region, and in particular, uh, in terms of these two large neighbors uh, that have these strong cultural and economic ties with your country. Yeah, I mean, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ifan. You have rightly pointed out that uh, that uh, Prime Minister Modi chose Bhutan to be his, uh, uh, I mean, the destination for his first foreign trip after assuming office. And uh, I was also so happy and honored to be uh, visiting India as my uh, first country, uh, I mean, first country to be visited after elections. So I, um, I have shared these uh, feelings a couple of times in, in national and international fora that, uh, that for a small country like Bhutan, all neighbors are equally important and bigger the neighbors more the importance i would say 
And traditionally, for generations, uh, for centuries, I would say, even before India became India, uh, we were very close. The leaders of the two countries had been very, very close. They had shared, shared gifts and letters that we can now uh, uh, be highly appreciative of. And then uh, it slowly came down to Bhutan being Bhutan now and India being India now. But the relation between the two uh, uh, sets of leaders in Delhi and in Thimpu, when I say leaders in Thimpu or Bhutan, I almost always uh, refer to His Majesty as the King. Because uh, we are very, very temporary on this seat. I may or may not come back after five years, be it by, by the general uh, consensus or by my own choice. I'm more than happy to go back to my operating theater and be a happy surgeon. But His Majesty has no choice. He will have no choice but to build this country better and give it to his son. That is what we believe in. And that is the unique thing about Bhutan. So uh, His Majesty is the kings in Thimpu and uh, the relevant leaders in New Delhi had uh, maintained these ties very, very closely. And uh, I'm very happy to be wearing these shoes now. And I was so warmly welcomed, even though that was my first visit. I was so warmly, warmly uh, welcomed. And uh, Prime Minister Modi was talking to me very, in a very, very uh, uh, conducive environment and friendly manner because it's not between Prime Minister Modi and Dr. Lothi. It's between India and Bhutan. So I think uh, that gave me that comfort. And every part of uh, land that we border, that we share, is actually uh, tradable, is actually fertile, is open and porous. So it's only natural that we have very, very good ties with, uh, uh, with uh, the neighboring countries. Because I always believe that a foreign policy will always be, almost always be based on human to human connection, a human to human relation and feelings. And uh, people living across that line called Indo Bhutan border are very, very friendly. So uh, that gives us the natural advantage. Whereas geographically on the Northern side, we have a long borders that is uh, that's not uh, habitable. And it's as some, some of the peaks are going up as high as uh, 8,000 meters above sea level. Yeah? Few passes are at around 4,500 to 5,000 above sea level. But yet, if one observes it very closely, we have lots of influence from northern border, um, bordering places for generations. Bhutan had strong traditional influence from Tibet. Bhutan had very, very strong influence, uh, cultural influence, um, Buddhist uh, values and uh, culture. Uh, we actually had uh, a, a close ties with uh, Tibet then, but that is China now. So uh, when we say China, we have influence from Tibet may not be the main line, but now it is China. So uh, we actually have, I would say, equal influence from either side. On foreign relation, we do not have any specific or absolutely different foreign relation from other countries. We, we being small, we being economically de dependent on others, we being a very resource-constrained country, we play our cards uh, in a manner we, we, that befits us or uh, uh, gives us the advantage. Thank you. Uh, my final question to you this evening for you, uh, as we speak uh, on this Monday, uh, May 23rd, President Joe Biden is attending the, the Quad Summit with his counterparts from uh, Japan, from Australia and India. You have, uh, in addition to your medical education in Bangladesh, uh, studied in Wisconsin uh, on, a, on a medical scholarship. Uh, you've uh, had a business education in Australia. This is a set of countries you're very familiar with in addition, of course, to India. Um, one of the hallmarks of this initiative is going to be what the president calls the Indo-Pacific Economic Partnership. I, I guess my question to you is, as you think about this conversation happening with the think tank here in Washington, D.C., what are your hopes for the relationship with the United States? What would you like the U.S. Uh, policymakers to think about when they think about Bhutan? Uh, Right, because we have all of these conversations occurring that seem to be the large countries of the region, now working with the large countries of the, of the West, talking about the Indo-Pacific, but very often smaller countries like Bhutan are not really central to those conversations, and yet they should be. So what, what, should, what is the message for Washington, D.C. from you and from your government? 
Uh, again, again, uh, back to my same old point. Uh, I actually have uh, no right or no say on what other countries think. Um, yes, you may be right, Dr. Ifan, that uh, every country should be given due importance and every country should be talked about. Every country should be important to the other country. That may not be wrong, but uh, to me, being frankly, uh, I mean, uh, to tell you frankly, I think every country will have uh, their own priorities. Every country will have actually uh, their strategies, uh, where uh, for many countries, I really doubt if Bhutan will be of any importance to many countries in the world. And I'm absolutely fine with that. Because as human being, we'll have our likes and dislikes. We'll have our needs and uh, whatever uh, uh, wants in lives. So similarly, a country will also have uh, um, her own choices based on any other X, Y, Z conditions we, which we don't want to uh, elaborate on. So uh, on that note, uh, yes, uh, we have very, very cordial relation with all the countries in the world, um, including United States. We have very strong consular relation with United States. We have a consul general working there. Uh, we are in very close touch, but geopolitically, economically, um, there's hardly any common paths that we normally cross. Uh, there's no formal trading at all of any sort between uh, US and my country. There's hardly any Bhutanese goods that is being uh, exported to United States. And we also do not import anything directly from United States. So on that note, it's only natural that, uh, that Prime Minister, uh, uh, President Biden do not refer to Bhutan. Uh, I don't see any problems with that. Yeah, so I mean, uh, this is a very good topic and we can keep talking on it again, but uh, looks like the time and today's uh, um, team of conversation may not allow us. Uh, Quad again, uh, with the changing, with the rapidly changing geopolitics, how important will it be for, for the world, world order rather, for India, for, for, the, for the other member countries? How will it, uh, um, uh, change or mold the, 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 the attitude of many other non-court countries, which we all know there's a lot of conversation on that. But deep down, better and stronger are our neighbors, better for us. We pray that all our neighbors uh, be very friendly, all our neighbors start doing very well, so that a small country pegged between two giants like China in the north and India in the south uh, benefit. We are actually, uh, our neighbors to the two most populated countries in the world, China and India. We are actually pegged between two countries that are growing at unprecedented rate. So we actually are very, very excited. There is no way Bhutan will be left behind between two rapidly growing uh, economies in the world. That is a wonderfully um, empathetic and uh, constructive way to view the situation. and. Uh, I wish I join you in that prayer uh, for the prosperity of India and China and through that for the entire region, including the people of the Kingdom of Bhutan. It has been a true honor for me to have this conversation with you. Uh, we hope we have the honor of welcoming you in person when you are next in Washington, D.C. Our doors are always open to you and your colleagues. And if we can ever be of service, uh, please let us know. On behalf of all my colleagues at the South Asia Center and at the Atlantic Council, uh, thank you very much for watching this conversation with Dr. Lotesh Thering, the Honorable Prime Minister of the Kingdom of Bhutan. I hope you join us again in a future time. Until then, be well, stay healthy, and be safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ifan and your team. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And uh, all to yourself and to your friends, uh, be my guest, visit Bhutan. We'll be opening to tourism very soon. We are still not yet open yet. Inshallah. Look forward to it. Thank All you. All right.